Come into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy. Come into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy, worthy of all our praise. Come into this house. Come into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy, worthy of all our praise. Worthy of honor and glory, worthy of power and praise. Magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy, worthy of all our praise. Come into this house, come into this house, magnify the Lord, lift up holy hands, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy. Worthy of all our praise. Worthy of honor and glory. Worthy of power and praise. Let us bow down before him. Exalt his name today. Come into this house. Magnify the Lord, Magnify the lift up holy hands, oh, our hearts in one accord, for he's worthy, worthy of all our praise. Oh, my God, worthy of glory, worthy of honor and glory, Sing it today. worthy of power and praise, let us bow down before him. Exalt his name today. Come into this house. Magnify the Lord. Lift up holy hands. Our hearts in one accord. For he's worthy. Worthy of all our praise. Clap your hands and praise him right now. We've come to praise him. We've come to praise him. We've come to praise him and lift his holy name. We've come to praise him. We've come to praise him. Joyful noise, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make a joyful noise, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Unto the Lord, you ought to praise the Lord. Oh, why? Come to praise him today. We come to praise him and lift his holy name. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. 
ought to praise the Lord. You ought to praise the Lord. While you have a chance, we come to praise him. Oh, we come to praise him. We come to praise him and lift his holy name. Praise him right now. Praise him in this house. Give him some glory today. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Is there anything that God's done for you that deserves some praise, that deserves some worship in this house? Well, my soul says yes to the Lord. I came to tell you, my soul, it says yes to the Lord. Oh, for he's a great king. How many knows he's doing great things? My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. He brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. He put my feet on straight street. He's got me going right. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. My soul says yes. Great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. He brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. He put my feet on straight street and got me going right. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. Oh, sing it. He gave me a song the angels cannot sing. For glory, hallelujah, I have been redeemed. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. He gave me a song the angels cannot sing. Glory, hallelujah, I have been redeemed. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. My soul says yes. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. My soul says yes to the Lord. Watch it, My soul says yes to the Lord. He's a great king. He's doing great things. My soul says yes, yes, yes to the Lord. Oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise God for saving me. Oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, 
praise God for saving me. One more time when I think of the goodness of Jesus. Oh, yes. And, and all he has done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Clap your hands and praise him. Somebody shout yes. Anybody in the house that God's done anything for today? I've got to praise him. I've got a right to praise him. I've got a right to shout. He saved me. Oh, yes, he Turn to two or three individuals, shake their hand today and say, I'm feeling good in Jesus. High praise is high praise we offer unto
Give him high praise today. He is worthy of it. Amen, amen. As we stand across the building, we appreciate everybody for taking the time to be here this afternoon. Haven't you already been blessed? Amen. We're excited to bring our next speaker to the floor. He's a man that's not a stranger to anybody here, a friend to everyone he meets, and we are so thankful to have him in the Florida district. I wonder if you'd welcome to this pulpit our friend, Brother Jeff Arnold. Let's do it unto the Lord. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very, very honored to be here. And uh, I was telling some of the fellas I'm a little late. I was in the parking lot at Publix getting ready to come and put my Bible on the top of the thing. And I blew 30 years of sermons all across the Publix parking lot. I picked up about 12 years of it. I'm going back to pick up the other 18 when I finish here. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's just, that's depressing. Wow. But I'm glad to be with you. Give honor to my fine superintendent, Brother Williams, and my prestitator. Amen. My friend Steve Boyd, District Secretary and Treasurer, Brother Varnum, of course, my good friend, Brother Treadway, that I was just with a few months ago and had a great time. And fine, fine people. I appreciate all of you. Thank you, Brother Hires. Wow, I've never seen this many men in a meeting since I've been in Florida. Wow. Tremendous. Now, I, I, I'm usually brought into a meeting because they believe I'm a wind-up toy. Just put me in the pulpit and I just crank for an hour. But uh, I, just, uh, I just feel like I need to talk to you. Brother, Brother Treadway will get you hanging from the roof and the rest of the two guys will scoot you back home. But I, I'd like to provoke you with some information. Uh, if you don't mind, and, and if it doesn't work out, I'll change gears and I'll preach something for you to make you feel real good. But uh, I think God has put me at a, at a crisis point in my life, in the life of the United Pentecostal Church. And, uh, and what I'm fixing to say, uh, you ain't never heard because I ain't never said it. And there ain't nobody else in the Pentecostal realm that I know of that is saying this. And so with that, I'll direct your attention to the book of Psalms, chapter 8, and beginning, please, with verse 3. Psalms 8 and verse 3. And uh, please don't get nervous. I pastor a wonderful church in Gainesville, and I've been trying for almost two years now to take them out of I-75 and let them know there's another road to ride. And anytime you ask Pentecostals to believe something they're not used to, they'll shut you down like a clam looking to hide. But I'm going to tell you something. The rejection of truth does not in any way stop the truth. And the acceptance of false doctrine, no matter how many accept it, never makes it truth. Amen. So, uh, so I'm, I'm giving you my emotional fervor for tonight. You just take care of it, and I'll shout with you. But I'm going to talk a little bit here, okay? Because I have one shot at you, and I really want to help you. Brother Sizemore, wherever I saw you, thank you. So good to see you again, my dear friend. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast set him, uh, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. I believe I've said this to you once before, but it needs to be repeated today. That is a mistranslation. You can check any Hebrew Bible, any Hebrew commentator. That is not what that scripture says, and you need to know that's not what it says. 
it says thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim thank you there's a thousand people here and three of you said that's right I know exactly where I need to be thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim you need to understand that said and has crowned him with glory and honor Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field. That means when he got started, he had dominion over Lucifer. He reminds me of the standard Pentecostal wussy who just stands still and lets his wife fight the battles. I can prove to you from the scripture when Eve was seduced by Lucifer, Adam was standing right there. And he just kept his mouth shut. Like sometimes we do about what our kids are watching or listening to or doing. And she didn't have the clout that Adam had. Well, let me try it again. The fowl of the air... And the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Lord, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. And I'll just quote the last scripture, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. My Bible study, my message today is simply, uh, what's it all about anyway? What, what, what's it all about anyway? Father, bless the ministry of the word Help me to be dynamic for you. I've only got 40 or 50 minutes to change 50 years of a mindset, and I sure need a miracle work in God. Help me right now. Bless the people. I, I, by faith, bind every devil and every demon, and I bind every spirit of doubt and fear and unbelief, and I bind the spirits of infirmity and disease and sickness, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would manifest yourself in the house by the time I'm finished, in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Elder. Could I get a glass of water, a bottle of water or something, please? Thank you. Now, I'm, I'm going to go real slow because i got to take you where you ain't never been. I read a statement the other day. It says, good leaders understand their mission. Take their followers where they've never been. Thank you, all three of you. Take your followers where they've never been. Thank you, son. Appreciate that very, very much. What is our mission? I don't want to be unkind to start off with, but I'm going to be. It is totally abnormal for a New Testament Christian not to possess an appetite for the supernatural. It, it really is. And, uh, and it is very easy. I, I listened to the praise. I took part of some of it. And I thought, wow, the 800,000 men, whatever's here, uh, just praising God and worshiping God. And I thought, boy, that's wonderful. Yet, it is possible for you and I to hide behind hand clapping and praise while we never step out and do beans for God. It is possible for you and I to hide in the church house and tell each other what we believe and let the sinner go to hell and the sick go to the hospital. This world doesn't need a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. This world needs a church, hey, that's full of the power of the Holy Ghost. This world needs a church that's willing to take a risk and even take a chance at failing trying to do what the will of God is instead of staying protected behind doctrine and singing. Just, just, just stay with me. You, you can be seated. I, I, I've, got, I've got a word to bring to you today. First, you must understand, when God made man, he made man as close to him as he could get without producing another God. When he made him, he made him in his mirror, his image, his reflection. He made him so close to himself that whatever he said, God would back up. 
Whatever he do, God would back up. The Bible said God crowned him with honor and glory. Sin uncrowned him and salvation recrowns him. We've got a special place in the heart of God. And it's not just to sing with each other and tell each other what we believe. It's time for the church not to be afraid to confront lost people, sick people, demonized people, witches, sorcerers. Now, I don't want to be misconstrued, Elder Bishop, but I'm going to tell you, we have practiced isolation until we're choking on it. It's time for us to Trump start trying to stay away from bad areas and bad stuff and get right in their face and confront them with a kingdom that is superior to what they're doing. You got to hear me. When God made man, he wasn't a sharecropper on the back 40. He was the head knocker. He was the vice regent. He was in charge of the planet. You, you didn't hear me. Your, your forefather was the head man. He said, I'll give you dominion over the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and the creeping thing and everything that moveth. You've got dominion. Now, you got to exercise it. The only reason you won't pray for the sick is you don't believe you got dominion. I'm here to tell you the devil's a liar. You've got, a, you've got authority. You've got the name of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the gift of the Holy Ghost. You've got two-thirds of heaven's angels who are ministering spirits sent to minister them who are the heirs of salvation. What you afraid of? Stay, stay with me. How, what time do I have? 45 minutes? I know we got to eat. I understand that. Uh, uh, uh. Here's our problem right now. We have an identity crisis. We don't see God like he is and sure enough don't see ourselves like we is. I'm going to mess with your theology. I don't care if you got more degrees than a thermometer and you've been to four Bible schools. I could give a flip less about that. The Bible said John wrote in 1 John 4, here it is, as he is, so are we now in this present world. Not as he was. We're on the wrong side of the cross. We're on the wrong side of the resurrection. We got to get back on this side. He is not a poor, poverty-stricken little man with a humble attitude and spit running down his face and blasphemy all over him. He's king of kings. He, he's lord of lords. He's the almighty God manifest in a glorified body. He is enthroned in the heavens. Everything is under his feet. Until you see Jesus as he is, you will not see yourself as you are. You need to stop jumping up. You, 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 you need to read Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 when it shows Jesus. See, you got a glorified man sitting in a heavenly cottage somewhere who has everything under his feet. And you're his body. Where's the feet located? See, see. I deal with that all over. Well, I'm going to pray for the sick. I'm going to cast out devils. What happens if it don't work? Let me flip it. What happens if it does? The sick aren't going to get offended. They're sick. The demonized ain't going to get offended. They're possessed. The hurting are not going to get offended. They're having a hard time. Put your hand down. Open your mouth and plead that Jesus would manifest himself. Now, 
I, I don't want to be offensive, okay? But I'm going to tell you something. If you and I do not have the miraculous working in our lives, we have nothing to give the lost but good advice. We were told to give them good news. Good advice just produces people who are more moral than they used to be. Good news produces a race of people who are supernaturally endowed, who live by the voice and the power of another world, who bring the kingdom of God to place here. Now, now, see, we're afraid of the unfamiliar. We love to, I'll just ask you a question. Is the present status and situation and condition of mankind what God originally intended for it to be? Well, then why ain't you fixing it? You say, oh, I can't fix it. Really? Liar, liar, pants on fire. What you mean you can't fix it? You ready? I'm going to mess with your theology. Jesus went on record and said, I've never healed one person. I've never cleansed a leper. I've never raised the dead. I've never cast out a devil. I've never done a miracle. See how quiet it is? But the answer to what I just said is in, in John 14. Think not that I do the works, but my Father... Don't you wish you had the Father in you? It's not the channel. It's not the container. It's the contents. If Jesus let the Holy Ghost work through him, you and I need to let the Holy Ghost work through us. Please, please be seated. I told you I wasn't going to inspire. I'm just going to expand the horizons of your mind. You've got to understand something. Until you realize the majesty and the glory of God in his own person, you will never expect the glory of God to be manifested in your life. I've done a study on glory. Now, we use that word and throw it around like a 7-Eleven and popcorn. But Jesus said, glorify thy name, O Father. And he said, I have glorified it. How did God glorify his name? Through the miraculous. That was five of you. Thank you very much. He said, glorify thy name. He said, I have glorified it, and I got news for you. I'm going to glorify it again. How? I'm going to get you out of the grave. And after I get you out of the grave, I'm going to put my nature in the people who believe in Calvary and believe in the resurrection. Pentecost is going to glorify me all over again. Because it's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. We can't do anything without his spirit, but we can do everything with his spirit. Just, just stay with me just a minute. I got more notes than a pharmacist. <sighs> so I, I got to slow down for a minute to tell you what the purpose of man was. Because unless you understand it, you just think the only reason you're here is to work your job, take a shower, reproduce, have babies, go to bed, and get back up again, and try not to get caught in sin. That's so dumb. <laughs> you're not much better than a roach. He can reproduce. You, you, listen, this is what I tell the wonderful folks in Gainesville. When you got up this morning, hell should have said, oh, no, he's up. Why? Here comes the kingdom. For the kingdom is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus said the kingdom is within you. That means wherever you go, you carry the kingdom with you. Wherever you express the kingdom, it is superior to any other kingdom. Would you turn and look at someone, if you had to wake them up, just wake them up and say, you know, hell ought to be afraid of you, not vice versa. 
You're, you're not hearing me. The microphone's not on. I can tell. Sit, sit down. When Jesus went into the wilderness, according to Matthew 4 and Luke 4, the Bible said that the serpent, Satan himself, the fallen one, the backslidden angel, came and talked to him and tried to barter with him. Listen carefully. You missed this. You missed everything I'm fixing to say. Satan has no power over you until you agree with him. Well, let me go further. And God's got no power in your life until you agree with him. How shall two walk together except they be agreed? But if you start agreeing with God, God will bust heaven loose, step into it. Step into this planet and he'll show you who's in charge. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Then he says, and sometimes you ask amiss. Sit, 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 down. sit down. Stay with me. Stay with me. When, when Jesus went to the wilderness, you know the story. The devil said, turn the stone to bread. Jump off the pinnacle and use your gifts and be a good charismatic cowboy and flaunt and prostitute your gifts so that you'll, everybody will be impressed with your gifts. One of the reasons why God doesn't let more gifts among us is he doesn't want the gifts to exceed our maturity. That's what you see happen to a lot of people that God gives gifts to. It exceeds their maturity and they end up in frustration, failure, sexual misconduct, and stupidity. Their failure should not stop us from stretching and reaching and trying to become more than we are. Just, just bear with me. Now, he, he tempted him, remember? Stones to bread, pinnacle to fame and forth. But the last one, he spread out all the kingdoms of the, of the world. He said, here, I know what you're here for, Jesus. You're here for these kingdoms. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a shortcut. You fall down and bow and worship me, and I'll give you this. Watch. For they were delivered unto me. I have it in my Bible. By who? Who gave Satan these kingdoms? And if he would answer, he'd say, well, Jesus, you, you, your, your brother did, Adam. I'm going to wait. That's too deep for shallow minds. Let's try that again. Who gave Satan power and authority over this world? Considering that Psalms 115 said, O Lord, the heaven and the heaven of heavens belongeth to thee. Here it is. But the earth thou hast delivered to the sons of men. So that's his domain. This is my domain. Now, now, now watch. And he said, the, all these kingdoms have been delivered to me. Now, either Jesus didn't know what he was talking about, or Jesus should have called him a liar, or Jesus believed that he was telling the truth. Why? Because Satan can get no authority and no dominion over any human being unless the human being submits, surrenders, and gives his authority to him. You say, well, I don't do that. Sure, we all do it every time we don't believe. Every time we don't expect God to show his stuff. Every time we don't expect God to fix something. See, we get held hostage by folks that die. I pray for lots of folks that die. What do you do? Bring up the next one. Why? Because I can't heal nobody. And if they get healed, I don't take the credit. And if they die, I don't take the blame. Because I can't heal them. It's the Father who dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. But Jesus can't do what he wants if the container doesn't release him. And sometimes we don't release him because we are afraid. I, I can feel it coming back to me. Come on, brother. I'll preach about what we're against.
Isn't it funny when Jesus came out of the wilderness and he wouldn't worship? Because see, Lucifer is a, is a snake. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. He can't tell the truth. He's the father of life. There's no truth in him. You say, well, he, he, he quotes truth. Yeah, but he never quotes all truth. He always leaves a portion off because he's a liar. And the portion he left off was the one that changes everything. He said, all these kingdoms I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Watch what Jesus said. Oh, I saw through your stuff. It's written, you should not worship only the God of heaven alone. Watch. And him shalt thou serve. Who said anything about serving? Oh, that's the part you left off. You see, you end up serving who or what you worship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I had time to deal about Worship and money and materialism and stuff and things and image. Bishop, am I doing okay yet? Just stay with me. Now, he comes out of the wilderness. The Bible says he went in the wilderness full of the Holy Ghost. He comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Ghost. What changes you from being full of the Holy Ghost to having the power of the Holy Ghost? You resist temptation, sin, and adversity. All the stuff that you and I keep running away from. God puts them in our lives so we can defeat them. Why? Because as we resist them and we defeat them, the power of the Spirit becomes released in our lives. we got to stop running away from everything. Stop isolating ourselves. Stop being afraid of this, that, and the other. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises in judgment thou shalt condemn. See, but, but you got to grasp who you are. Come on, you got to grasp who you are or you got to believe that Jesus didn't know what he's doing. Because he turned around and put these 11 guys in charge of world evangelism. And they just finished disbelieving three reports about his resurrection. Because they were good Pentecostals and they have a hard time going to the next level. They had done miracle signs and wonders. They had cast out devils. They had healed the sick. But now here's a new one. Resurrection from the dead. We don't believe that. Just like us. We believe, believe that Jesus healed people in the Gospels. We believe he, he worked with everybody in the book of Acts. But since then, he's got laryngitis and he's on vacation. We're like the Church of Christ. Don't believe God talks no more. Really? Now, he ain't had nothing to the Logos. This is forever settled. And he's never going to say anything that contradicts this book. But what we need as Pentecostals is a rhema word from God. We, ne uh, we need God to tell us something fresh and... F What's it? Can I prove it to you, Brother Yuba? You ready? Here we go. The Lord said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the Logos. You ready? Paul tries to go to Bithynia, and the Holy Ghost says, no. Well, make up your mind. Do we go into the whole world, or don't we? Then he tries to go to a second city, and the Spirit forbade him. Why? Because timing is everything. And then all of a sudden he gets a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come over and help us. He never did find that man for a long time. All he found was that lady washing clothes at the river. Let me try it again. And the only way he met the man in the vision was when God got his carcass beat up and half dragged down the street and threw his carcass in the prison and then said, the Philippian jail is the man, talk to him. You're fussing and cussing because you got to work with sinners and you got to work with dirty minded and dirty mouthed people. Don't you understand that's the platform to portray the goodness of God? Don't you understand you've got more stuff to show them? We're not here to condemn them. We're here to confront them and convert them and impact them and show them that the kingdom of God is better than the kingdom of the devil.
So, so when Jesus came out, he came out in the power of the resurrection and the power of the Holy Ghost. And the next time he meets the devil in the same chapter, he goes to church because everything in church doesn't love God. Take it from a pastor. Everything that comes to church ain't in love with God. And he goes to the church house and there's a guy demon possessed. Isn't it funny? They're like our churches. They'll put up with their trash because they can't take it out. You're not hearing me. Here's how you can tell when somebody's got a dirty spirit. When that spirit says to the preacher, leave us alone. I'm going to wait. That's too good just to slide by. I pastor a wonderful church, but I got lots of people who sit there with their fingers stuck in their nose and their fanny super glowed to the pulpit, to the pew, and they turn around and say, leave us alone. We're just here to put in our tithing. Here's our two bucks. Don't bother us. It's a dangerous thing when you become satisfied with who you are and what you are, and you don't want to be better than you are. I'm going to say the best I can. This group of men ought to leave here so dangerous. I mean so intimidating to hell that hell's going to start telling you, leave us alone. Let us alone. Let us play our game. But you can't do it. Why? You are the expressors of the kingdom of God. And we usually think that expressing the kingdom's only got to do with doctrine. Sit, 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 sit down, sit down, sit down. I don't, I don't want to ask you if I'm doing good because I'm nervous. You got to hear me. So you got to understand that when God made man, he made him in his likeness, in his image. He was put in the image of God, but if you read your Bible in chapter 2 of Genesis, he was not created in the garden. He was put in the garden. There's a reason why. Watch this. This, if this don't move you, man. Go join the Baptist church. Are you ready? Here we go. Here we go. He put him in the garden, watch, to discover its secrets, to till its ground, and to protect its environment. Because he said, in the, in the kingdom of the garden, you exercise your dominion. So he told him in Genesis 1.28, let him have dominion. But he didn't have dominion anywhere but in the garden. Outside of the garden was chaos, darkness, evil, disaster. Watch. God's purpose was to let this guy learn how to show dominion, reflect the image and the will and the purpose of God, and as he produced and reproduced children who were in harmony with heaven, they would then spread out from the garden and affect the whole world so God's desire could be fulfilled, which was that the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord is not a word. The glory of the Lord is simply God manifesting His own being and presence. When God gets glorified, He shows up, shows off, and shows out. See, God is intangible. God is invinci- invisible. In fact, God is unreachable. You can't even locate him. He dwells in the light that no man can approach. But when he gets to glorify himself, what God's glory is, he takes the intangible, immaterial, and invisible and manifests himself. And so when the glory of God shows up, everything that's anti God got to go. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but contrary to our attitude in Pentecost, God never met a devil or a disease he liked. In fact, uh, see how quiet it just got? Well, if we don't get sick, how are we going to die? Real easy. The Bible said he satisfied the righteous with long life. And he fulfilleth their days. Watch. And he taketh their breath and they are no more. God ain't got to give you cancer and diabetes and leukemia for you to leave this world. He can just go and you just go to sleep and you're gone.
If sickness is the will of God, as some of you believe, then Jesus must have violated his own father's will because he healed everything he found. Let me try it. You want Bible? Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power. That's our problem. We got the Holy Ghost, no power. But he anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power who went about healing all. Now, what problem do you have with all? Is that a deep Greek word? You want to know what it means in Hebrew? All. You want to know what it means in Floridian? All. You want to know what it means in Swahili? All. He went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Don't you wish God was with you? You got to face these things and come against them like David did with Goliath. You come to me with sword and spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord. You and I got to start looking at stuff and sit, sit down and simply say this. If this stuff that I'm dealing with doesn't exist in the kingdom of heaven, it ain't got no right here. You, you, you missed it. Next time you find leukemia in heaven, call me. Blindness, deafness, MS, MD, crippling diseases. Polio, leukemia. You find any of that trash in the kingdom of heaven, give me a call. You're not hearing me. Watch what he said. And when you pray, you say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here it is. Here's the buster for Pentecost. We got to grab it. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You ready? Here we go. In earth. In earth. Ain't no nervous breakdowns in heaven. In earth. Ain't no cancer in heaven. In earth. Let thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So you need to find out what's going on in heaven and ask God to manifest the kingdom of heaven right here. I pray for people and they stay sick. I pray for people and they get worse. I pray for people and they die. I can't help it. I'm doing everything I can to make connection with God so that God can flow through me. But I am refusing to be intimidated by what I see. Listen to me. If you don't remember anything, remember this. Faith, true faith, is anchored in the unseen and its realties. Unbelief is always anchored in the visible, the material. One is superior, the other is inferior. Faith has the ability to look into that world and bring that world into this world. Faith is the birth canal that a woman has from belly to womb that brings the miracle baby from inside to, uh, to the outside. Faith is the connecting rod. Faith is the link. Faith is the birth canal that brings the answer that already exists in that world to manifest itself in this world. Now, now, now I, I know it's hard for you to just boogaloo and shout and carry on, and I'm blowing your mind. I know that. I know that. But listen to me. Watch how great God is. When his boy backslid. You know, that's a nice thing. God pastored two people in paradise. They both backslid and he never gave up. You're not careful. Some of you that pastor people and they become whoremongers and fornicators and liars and cheats. You don't want to quit the ministry or like we do. Let's just keep changing churches. God lost his entire choir, well, one-third of his heavenly choir, and he never quit being God. I've, lo I've lost members of my choir, and I've debated. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. If God couldn't keep two people living in perfection, 
clothed with the light of God and the righteousness of God in a place where there was nothing except one temptation and he couldn't keep them saved. Don't shoot yourself in the foot because some of your people act nuts. Have you ever thought that God gets a big kick out of picking up trash and transforming it into treasure? That trash and brokenness and messed up lives are God's raw material that he ends up... That when he finishes it, he'll show you off to the whole world and to the devil and say, look what I did with refuse. Look what I did with backsliders. Look what I did with fornicators. Look what I did with child molesters. Look what I did with messed up people. My power is great. It's not the material. It's my power. If God could step in to the disaster and the chaos in Genesis 1 and recreate a world out of nothing. See, God, God's the official restoration business. He takes junk and makes it jewels. In fact, the gospel is no more or less than God going on a garbage hunt. Now, you're laughing, but let, let me try it again. And you'll be working for the garbage man. And who are you? I'm Jeff Arnold. I, I pick up garbage. You see, we get frustrated. We still want lawyers and doctors and nobles and mighty men. and Folks, they don't even make normal sinners anymore. <laughs> folks that come to our church, she's had four kids by three guys, been divorced twice, shacking up with him, thinking about marrying him. It's hell on earth when you have Mother's Day at our place. It's worse when you have Father's Day. You feel like saying, to whose wife will she be in the resurrection? You think I'm kidding you. You want people to come in your church who pay tithes, don't cause no trouble, fast once or twice a week, hardly watch any TV, love God, talk in tongues all the time. They don't exist. I don't think you hear me. The whole human race is one big junkyard, and he sends us up as ambassadors and representatives, employees of the heavenly king, to go pick up a bunch of refuse and trash that we think is no good. He says, I don't care what you think. Get them to have an encounter with me. Let them be touched by my power. Let my blood wash their sins, and you watch and see what I can do. This ain't about our human talent on parade. This is about God. So I've said that 15 or 20 minutes, whatever I preached, to say this one thing. God is so unique in that watch. He decided not to destroy the devil who caused all the hell and trouble. Instead, he voted to defeat the devil by the one that he delegated. Now, no, wait, that's too deep for your little mind. Let's, let's go one more time. Instead of going poof, he said, no, nah, I'm not going to poof because it ain't fair because me and you ain't on the same page. I can sneeze in your direction and vaporize you. So we, we, we won't bother with you. are just a dumb flunky that got fired for non-performance. See, that's why hell fights worship all the time. Why? Because we got hired and took his job. That's why you have trouble with the choir. That's why you have trouble with people praising. We got his job, and he's ticked off. You ready? Here's what I got to say. Tough break. I will make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I will serve the Lord with gladness. I will come before his presence with singing. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will do it. You, you sit down. I, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not making much headway here. See, you got you to go home and read the book of Job. Just read the first three chapters. Because Job was a fantastic worshiper. And you ready for this? And he had a lot of nickels. Some of you think worship has to do something with poverty. Uh-huh. I'm waiting for God to give me five million. I'll show him how much I love him. 
You think I'm kidding you? Just come on and bless me a while. I'll show you. You think I can't worship good with $500 in my pocket as I can with $62 overdrawn in the bank? Is that what makes you a worshiper? That's called prostituting worship so you can make God be your busboy and make him give you something. We need to come to church not asking God to give us something. We need to come and bless the Lord, oh my soul. We need to come and glorify God. We need to come and make an atmosphere that is conducive to the supernatural whether we get it fixed or not. You, 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 you keep interrupting me here. I mean, if you read, there's 42 chapters of the book of Job. All I'm asking you to do is just read two, maximum three. Job was a great worshiper. He lost all his stuff. He lost his kids. He lost his stuff. And he still praised and worshiped God. Then he lost everything. He lost his health and his wealth. And, and then he still sat down and praised God. But after chapter 3, you can't find Satan. You ready? I'm fixing to go crazy because Satan don't know what to do with a worshiper. Because Satan thinks the only reason we praise and thanks and worship is because he gives us nickels and nice clothes and a car and a house and a vacation. I want to ask you something. If God lets hell take your stuff, will it also take your song? Will it also make you quiet? Will it stop you from praising God? Can we stand on the grave of our wife or our children or our loved ones? And say, I love you anyway. What do I got? 15 minutes? Oh. Woo. Please, please be seated. I know I've mentioned twice already, if you miss this, you miss my whole sermon. Now I'm going to give you one you ain't never heard. And if you miss this, you're just loony. God expects us to operate in the supernatural every day because when you received the Holy Ghost, you became pregnant with His DNA. It says Peter writes and says, wherefore we have received the divine nature of God. So what are miracles? God acting like himself. What are miracles? God saying amen to his own word. I'm going to tell you, confessing before the superintendent and all the rest of you. I am out of patience with myself. I have been held hostage for 30 years preaching till my underwear has fallen down and getting people to hoop and holler and carry on and holding myself hostage because I didn't have any gifts. Oh, Freddie's got one and Martin's got one and this one's got one and that one can read your zip code and he can tell you what's wrong with your pancreas. And so I can't do nothing because I don't have no gifts. I'm out of patience with that. I have one gift, I have the gift of the Holy Ghost, and all the gifts of the Spirit are in the Holy Ghost. And I'm just praying every time I pray. If I need the gift of miracles, Lord, manifest the gift of miracles. If I need a word of discernment, give me discerning of spirits. If I need a word of knowledge, help me to know what I'm dealing with. Come on, folks. we got to believe that God wants the supernatural to become normal for the church. Anything less than that is abnormal Christianity. We've got to rescue the book of Acts from being a history book. It's got to be a workbook. It's got to be an inspiration. It's got to be a pattern for us. No, no, no. Sit down now. My superintendent's here. I'm going to say this and you can correct me when I'm done. But I'm here to tell you, contrary to what we've always been told, I personally, I don't think you've got to pray much more. If you have a regular prayer life, you ain't got to pray much more. You've got to believe. 
You see, belief is the catalyst that releases the energy. The purpose of prayer and fasting is to diminish the throttle choke that flesh has on us. You see, we pastor people who are so inundated with the spirit of the natural world. That we get intimidated by it. Watch, watch this. But the doctor said. But the, but the urine specimen said. But the x-ray and the MRI said. Now, I'm going I'm to just go out on a limb here, okay? Because that's where the fruit is. <laughs> I'm going out on the limb. Are you ready? Watch this. I am not, by living a life of faith, denying the urine specimen or the blood specimen, or the x-ray, or the MRI. Listen, and I'm not defaming and damning and ridiculing these precious men and women of medical science who are trying to alleviate suffering from people's body. What I am saying, I'm going to a higher court of appeal. I'm rising above that. I'm leaving the general practitioner, and I'm going to the Mayo Clinic. And after I leave the Mayo Clinic, I'm going to Jesus' throne of grace. If he says it's over, it's over. If he doesn't say it's over, I have been welcomed to the throne of grace to come boldly to receive help in a time of need. I am not denying the report. I am not denying the poverty or the bankruptcy or the bank statement. I'm just saying I've been invited to another world that can impact this world. Please, please, please be seated. So, so you've been called like, like, like Adam, watch, to subdue your little area, watch, and then extend its boundary. Because the gospel is simply the extension of the kingdom of God. I don't think you're getting me. You see, when Jesus showed up, he said two things to people. I represent the kingdom of God, and by the way, I'm also the king. What I say goes. And he never met a devil that tried to stay. And he never met a disease that said, oh, I'm going to fight with you now. He said, I don't think so. In fact, the worst storm they were in, all he said was, peace be still. He don't break out into a sweat, pal. You're not hearing me yet. See, I, 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 you, you need to walk up to stuff sometimes and hell says, oh, no. Not, not you again. You're not going to do that tongue-talking stuff again, are you? You're not going to lay hands. Oh, come on. Well, just preach doctrine. Everybody will like it. Okay, I'll preach doctrine. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm sorry, sorry. Now, the, the hard part of my little Bible study today is simply this. All this stuff I'm preaching has not come to fulfillment and fullness yet in my life. But I'm getting little etchings of it, little scratchings of it. I, I read a book. I have a wonderful book on uh, It's called A Book of Quotes. Maybe you can find it. I think somebody gave it to me for Christmas. And I love to read these quotes. I wish my brain was that smart that I could remember all that stuff or come up with it. But I did read a quote by Gretzky, and he's that world hockey guy. And, and it was such a great quote. It changed my life. He's, they asked Wayne Gretzky about of hockey, and he said, I notice I miss 100% of the shots I'm afraid to take. I notice I miss 100% of the healings I'm afraid to try for. I notice I miss 100% of the people getting the Holy Ghost of those who I'm afraid to pray for. I, I notice I miss 100% of the blessings of God when I'm afraid to give and sacrifice and submit and surrender. If practice makes perfect, we can get better with practice. And I don't care what we've been taught. God does not get mad with us when we try to practice spiritual stuff. The writer of Hebrews said, They... 
who by reason of use have their senses exercised thereby. See now, that means you get muscles when you lift. You get better at riding a bike when you try. Anybody in the house ever rode a bike the first time? Come on. Anybody besides me ever fell over four or five, six different times? Let me try it again. Anybody besides me ever fell over and almost broke your nose and your arm and scuffed your leg? You're just a kid. And you swore to yourself, I ain't getting on that vile machine no more. And then my father said, you're getting back on and the training wheels are coming off. And he'd hold on. Have me, anybody besides me ever rode a bike like this? Scared to death, didn't want it, was supposed to be enjoyable. You couldn't enjoy it. But after a while, you kept getting on and you kept getting off. You kept getting on and you kept getting off. And after a while, man, you was cruising. After a while, you was riding five miles. After a while, you could do tricks on the bike. Why? They who by reason of use have their senses exercised thereby. That's the same way with spiritual stuff. That's the same way with Holy Ghost stuff. The more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you try, the better you get at it. Don't be afraid. Let me help you. I'm almost finished. I'm not done. I'm just going to quit. I'm almost finished. Listen. Listen. When a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, is in harmony with heaven, that harmony produces God a platform that allows him to show up. Now, I'm going to say something that you, you may not believe, but I'm right anyway. But you don't have to believe it if you don't want to believe it. But I'm right anyway. Without a man on this planet, God has no legal representative. Oh, no, he, he committed the preaching of the gospel to men. That's why even when Jesus showed up and knocked Saul off his donkey, he couldn't tell him how to get saved. He said, I'll go, go in there and somebody will tell you what you got to do. Well, why don't you tell him? You got him right on the ground. You could tell him real easy. He'd really believe it. No, I've committed the preaching of the gospel and the delivering of souls and bodies to man. So I'm going to send a man to you to tell you because man, you're right. Men matter to God because a man becomes God's legal focal point. That's why Jesus became a man. Yeah. yeah. God didn't just manifest himself. He's spirit. He has no blood. He has no body. He didn't just show up and say, boo. He didn't do that. God became one cell swimming up inside a woman's body. One cell. And when that baby plopped out of her body, God now had a legal rep. You're not hearing me. The book of Job says that the womb of the woman is the doors of life. What does that mean? That anything that's born from a woman's body now has experienced legal entry. And once you're here legally, now you've got authority and ability and power to represent God. You're not hearing me yet. You see, your adversary and my adversary is an alien. He's an intruder. He's a liar. He has no right to be here. He was never born here. He has invaded this land. So God turned around and he legally invaded this place in the body of Jesus. And now that body's gone. And now he legally invades this place with our bodies. Your body! Is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Don't fornicate. Don't be a whoremonger. Don't be filled with anger and lust and envy and strife. Your body is God's legal weapon. See now, that's why Paul said, present your body a living sacrifice. Don't take your body and turn it into some kind of whorehouse or some TV video fantasy world. Come on, get your head out of the sand. Don't be stupid enough to call a 900 number. Rent a porno video and say it ain't going to affect you. Give me a break. Yeah, it's, it's quiet right now. I just struck on something. I told you before, I'm going to tell you again. Here's how you tell if you're watching a video or your TV or whatever you're doing. Here's how you can tell what's any good. How do you like this, Jesus? 
I'm going to wait till everybody says, how do you like this, Jesus? If he gets up and leaves, you better turn it off. If he stays, give him some popcorn. Now, you think I'm kidding you. I could save the whole general conference from four hours of debate if they just let me tell you how to do this. God has given us all things freely to enjoy. But there's a difference between enjoying something and being dominated and ill-affected by it. Don't you understand a lot of this sex stuff and this violent stuff and this blood stuff? That's a bloodthirsting spirit that's in this land. Paul wrote to the church one time and said, and it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Then he says, and it's wrong and evil for you to take pleasure in those things. You say, well, I'm not fornicating. I'm not with all the queers and the fags. I'm not into all that trashy stuff. Yeah, but you're enjoying watching it. We're not supposed to take pleasure in stuff that we believe is wrong. Well, I just... I'm going to give you a little courage. If it's not right, get rid of it. Turn it off. You got an on and off switch? Just turn it off. Make for things that edify. Can I have 10 minutes? Just 10 minutes? I know, I know we got to go. 10 minutes, okay? I, I, haven't, I haven't got this. You got to hear me. I'm talking about men matter. Watch. If you can see yourself, because it's all about identity, that you and I are the vital link between two worlds. God doesn't do anything without us. We're his legal ambassadors. I don't know whether you've ever heard. Can one, can one of you guys give me a Bible and just read a scripture? Could you, so either, anybody, any of you read? Can you just give me, Brother Varnum, can you read? 2 Corinthians 5.18. Give the man a mic. Let me just show you something. I'm almost finished. I'm not even started with this yet. This is so powerful. Because we are afraid of the supernatural. But we ought to be ashamed of our powerlessness. And it's not powerlessness because we don't have authority. Jesus gave us authority. Oh, yes, he did. We have authority. I told our church Wednesday. We have authority because we are positionally set with Jesus in the heavens. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 22, 23, and Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. We are seated with him in the heavens. Positionally. Now, actually, you're here, but positionally, you're there. Oh, look at it. Boy, you're acting like Episcopalians. You don't believe nothing. Ready? And by the way, and you've received power because, you see, there's two words that are recorded four times in the Scriptures of power. I give you power over all the power of the enemy, you know, Luke 10, 17. One word is exousia, which means authority. The other word is dunamis, which means ability. So he says, I've given you authority over his ability. Now, wait a minute. A little further, just in case you needed some bullets for your gun, in Acts 1.8 and Acts 4, he said, you shall receive power, dunamis. So you have the inherent nature of God in you. You've got to believe that that nature doesn't want people diseased and demonized and dysfunctional. And it's a shame for the church to send, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what they say. It's a shame for the church to send people to psychiatrists. Now, we may have to send them there because we ain't what we ought to be and we ain't got what we ought to be working like it ought to be. But I'm going to tell you what. God wants us to be able to pray the prayer of faith that people's nerves calm down, that they don't have a nervous breakdown, that they don't flip out, that they don't become suicidal. The problem is we got an identity crisis. We major on our own disabilities and it blinds us to his abilities instead of looking at him we look at ourselves and say well I'm not worthy and I'm weak and I haven't really prayed and I'm nobody and I'm what you are agreeing with the devil that's what gives him power over you because the pagan and the heathen need more than nice words and our pagans and our heathens just have degrees and fine suits. 
The only thing that's going to make the natural world let go of its hostages is the invasion of the supernatural world. Moses could not get those three million Jews out because he told them about his experience. I was speaking to a bush and it burned and now let him go. Oh no, it was a power encounter. It was a clash between two kingdoms. It was their magicians against this guy with the magic stick. They messed with him for four or five signs and then when it's over, they stepped back and said, we ain't going to undo it this. This is the finger of God. This is the power of God. You better let him go. See, Pharaoh didn't, oh, you're not hearing me. Pharaoh didn't let the slaves go just because he had a better message. He let him go because power stepped into the building and said, let him go or I'll kill everything in this place. You got to believe that God wants to manifest his power through our lives. It's not our worthiness. It's his worthiness. It's not our ability. It's his ability. It's not our desire. It's his desire. Give, give me five minutes. Five minutes. I see it's 20 to 4. Give, is that right? 20 to 4. Give me five minutes. Just You ready, brother? You ready, brother? Uh, Varnum, I'm would ready. you read that scripture for me? And all things are of God. Yeah. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Yeah. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Yeah. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now watch this. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the key to everything. We pray you in Christ said. Stop. Wrong translation. Incorrect. You read it right, but it's wrong. Every New Testament manuscript records the word you in italicis. It was added by the transcribers. We pray you in Christ said. Wrong. Here's what it says. We pray in Christ's stead. See, until you see the identity that we are Jesus' replacement body, the first body left for heaven, the second body is here right now. The same holy power that lived in the first body lives in the second body. When you lay hands on people and pray for people, you pray in Christ's stead. You are his legal deputized ambassador. You remain standing. I'll, I'll, thank you, Brother Varnum. I, I'm sorry I didn't get to my sermon. It was a good one. It really was. You see, your vision all starts with your identity. Until you see yourself as a threat to hell, as a legalized ambassador for Jesus Christ. You know what an ambassador does? They're sent to a foreign land. They're like a colony outpost. And the, watch, and the ambassador, this is so powerful, the ambassador determines the size of his dominion. And when he stays within his dominion, the mother country says, I'll support you with arms, weapons, technology, finance, food, while you're in the foreign land. So he's here, surrounded by all these numbskulls, but he's attached to another land. And whatever he says and whatever he does, that land backs him up. Watch. You are ambassadors for Christ, and that land backs you up. I want to say this in closing, Bishop, okay? Thank you for listening. One of the biggest problems the Pentecostal church is having is this, this stupid fodder about success. And I'm going to say this. I'm closing. We have a problem with success. But I'm here to tell you that success, in God's eyes, is not measured by the size of your bank account, nor your church, hold on, nor your fame, your wealth, or your notoriety. Listen to this. True biblical success is when you and I realize the original intention that God had for us when he first asked us to walk with him.
And when you understand your intention of God's calling in your life, it sets you free from jealousy and strife over other people's victories. And it gives you a baptism that helps you encourage other people that are struggling because you are secure in your success. I am doing what God has called me to do. The only reason Saul ever attacked David was because Saul had missed his moment in time had not fulfilled the intention of God for his life. Therefore, he attacked that which God was blessing. The great difference between King Saul and little David was simply this. Saul got intoxicated and loved with the position and the palace. David was in love with the presence and the possibility. Thank you for letting me talk to you. I, I would be amiss right now. I would be amiss if I didn't. See, here's our problem. We don't give God room to work. We're on a time schedule. We're tired. We're sweaty. We're blah, blah, blah. But, but I'm not afraid of any of you. I'm not. I know I can't fix nobody. So I don't take credit. And I don't take blame. But I am responsible to God. You read it right, El. We pray in Christ's stead. I pray you. We pray in Christ's stead. Now, Lord, confirm your word. Mark 16, 20, it says, And they went everywhere preaching Christ, God working with them, comma, confirming his word with signs and wonders following. Now, if he's never changed and he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever, then what are we afraid of? So now I want you to turn and look at somebody and just because I ain't got time to do all this and ask anybody if you're in any kind of pain right now. Would you just ask them if you have any kind of disease or any kind of pain? Because we've got to get away from this Catholic Pentecostal thing that the Pope does everything. Wait a minute. Okay, I couldn't get much help here. Put your hand up in the air if you have disease, diabetes, cancer. Pancreatic problems. Okay, what do we got? Oh, but this is easy. One, two. We got 15 of you. Come on to the front of the platform. This will be easy. This, I thought this was going to be hard. This is going to be easy. Just, just line up along here. I, you ain't got to tell me nothing. God already knows your stuff. And I hate to hurt your feelings, but I ain't got no magic. But, okay, just, just line up along here. If you have, how many of you have pain in your body right now? Right now. Okay. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Pain in your body, and when God would touch you, you would be able to be aware that either one or two things is going to happen. It's either going to diminish and improve a little, or it's going to be completely gone. Okay? That, that's all. That's, but, but I don't understand how, you know, because sometimes God chooses to give you a miracle, which is instantaneous. A miracle is not restorative. The gift of healing is restorative, just like medicine, like an antibiotic. It's restorative. But a miracle is recreative. So nerves are fixed and, and bone is replaced or a kidney is come or an eye. I prayed for a lady the other day in Texas whose eye was boom. And, and God, I prayed for her and she got a little better and sight came back. And then three days later, Tom forced to call me and she was completely healed. And pray for this guy who was deaf here in his both ears. And I put my fingers in his ears. I can't heal nobody. And when I prayed for him, I just leaned over in his ear. In fact, when I talked to him, Brother Hires, I said, If the Lord heals you, he's over there standing, would you serve him? And he looked at me like this. He can't hear nothing. I said, Hey, if the Lord heals you, would you serve him? He said, Yeah, I serve him. Because people who can't hear can't speak. Boy, that's another message. We just passed that one right now. So I went over. Hey, Brother Wolf, I was praying for you this morning. I was. And, and I sat down and I put my rump right on the end of that thing. And I just went like this and I leaned over and I stuck my fingers in his ears. Were you scared? You ain't kidding. Weren't you full of confidence? No. Why? Um, it's new to me. Put my fingers in his ears and said, in the name of Jesus... 
I ask you to show mercy because healing is a mercy. See, it's a covenant problem. It's the people in the covenant. But this guy wasn't even in the church, so it's a mercy. I said, have mercy on him and open these ears right now. Didn't feel nothing. Took my fingers out. I leaned over to him. He was facing me, his right ear, and I said, can you hear me? He said, yeah, I can hear you. I went to his, his left ear, and I said, can you hear me? Yeah, he said, hey, preacher, that was real good. Thank you. And he shook my hand. Well, then we prayed for him, and he got the Holy Ghost in five seconds. Five seconds. Let, 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 let me just say this. There was an 18-year-old girl in the back standing like this. 18 years old. She has scoliosis. Her spine's like an S. She's like this. I'd ask people who had spinal problems, what have just stand up. I felt, I just felt. I don't always feel it, but I felt it then that the Lord had healed every one of them if they would honor him in faith. And she's just standing up like this. And when I just prayed, she told Brother Foster that somebody with a hand hit her in her spine and it went. And she's still straight. I just talked to him. She's still straight, bending over, touching her toes. Now, now wait a minute. This is so easy. Now, now, all of you that want prayer or need prayer, you got pain in your body, would you do me one more favor? Just lift your hands up just for a second. Okay, now keep your hands up. Now I need about 50 of you professed believers. Come on. Keep your hands up. I'm not going to do this because this is what we always say. Let the preacher do it. No, no, I'm not going to do this. The believer's going to do it. I want you to find somebody and step in front of them. Come on, it'll take me just a 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Just... Give them a little room. Walk inside of them. Get in front of them. Because we always pray behind them. That way if it didn't work, we don't look bad. No, we'll get in front of them. And what I want you to do, well, come on. I know it's a little crowded, but as best you can, get, 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 get over here. Maybe some of you need to come up on a platform or something and just get in front of these guys. I just want you to ask them where the pain is and what's wrong. And then ask them if they believe Jesus wants them well. When you hear it, Speak to the pain. Don't pray. Oh, Jesus. Don't do that. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and told us to speak to the mountain. He told Ezekiel to speak to dead bones. Sometimes you got to talk to stuff that looks like it ain't listening. Have we got everybody? I, I, I'm missing a bunch of people up here. I, uh, maybe you can't get. I, I tell you, all you folks that are facing me right now, do me a favor and turn around and face the audience. Would you? Just turn around. We need some people to come through here. Come on, don't be afraid. It ain't you. Now I want you to speak to them after you get what's wrong with them. And then after you finish praying and speaking to it, ask them if the pain has diminished any. Ask them if anything has changed. You deserve the glory and the honor. These Lord, signs shall follow them that believe. As we in my name, they shall lay hands on the sick you and they'll recover. The glory and the honor. Come on, Lord. Lord Father, I can't reach them, but I pray for my friend Jim Wolf. I pray against that neuropathy. I pray against disease in his body. I've been asking you day after day to heal my friend. To cause this pain and dysfunction to disappear. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no There is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the 
deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory and the honor. We lift our hands in worship. Hallelujah! As we magnify your name, for you are great. You do miracles so great. Hallelujah! There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great. Hallelujah! You do miracles so great. There is Ask them no if they're any better. Like Ask them if they're not. Pray again. Pray there again. Is no pray again. One else like Ask them. You, for you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. For you are great. You do miracles. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else. For you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you, for you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you, for you are great, you do miracles so great, there is no one else like you, there is no one else like you. In My Jesus' God name. In Jesus' can do name. Anything. Yes, I believe. My God. Help my unbelief. Yes, I believe. Can do Help anything. my unbelief. He's got yes, the power. I believe. I believe. He's got the power. He's got the power. He's got the power. My God can do anything. 